Over 500 people have made the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Angela Davis is its most distinguished. Not only is she one of the most sophisticated and accomplished individuals on the list, she is also only the third woman to ever appear on it. In 1969, she was hired as a professor. However, she was soon fired for her political affiliation and controversial comments. But her life was about to get a lot more complicated. In 1970, she would be charged with aggravated kidnapping and first-degree murder. The case quickly became politically charged and embroiled in racial tensions, prompting Davis to become a fugitive from the law. A courthouse escape, hostages, dangerous love, a quadruple murder, and evading the police. That's coming up on Ladies Love Crime. Angela grew up to become a distinguished academic, but her education in racism would begin at a very young age. She lived in Birmingham, Alabama. Her neighborhood was mostly black, making it a target for the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, so many black homes were bombed by the KKK, the area was more commonly known as Dynamite Hill. Becoming a target was a real and present danger, especially since her mother was an active member of the NAACP. Angela would later move to New York City and attend Irwin High School. Here she would start to form her political ideology. As a student, she watched as several teachers were blacklisted for their ties to the Communist Party. After graduating, she would head to Brandeis University to pursue a degree in philosophy. It was here in college that she would start putting her life experience into action and would become active in the civil rights movement. She was also involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Black Panther Party, and the American Communist Party. After earning her master's degree, Angela was hired to teach philosophy at UCLA. Governor Ronald Reagan wasn't happy about this and ordered the University of California Board of Regents to fire her because of her affiliation with the Communist Party. The court reversed her firing. However, the board would go on to fire her again for using, quote, inflammatory language. Now Governor Reagan vowed that Angela would never again teach at the University of California. This put Angela on the government's radar. Later that year, she would be on their most wanted list. During this time, Angela began researching the prison industrial complex. This pursuit would lead her to the Soledad brothers and right into the arms of George Jackson. Angela and George's love story is unconventional, yet inspiring in how it formed under immense pressure and stress. It was Angela and George against the government. George was a mirror. He represented all the struggles, discrimination, oppression, racism, and political prosecution that Angela had endured in her life. Everything she was fighting for and everything she was fighting against was all wrapped up in one person. His path to meeting Angela was one of agony and tragedy, however. George was just 18 years old when he was accused of stealing $70 from a gas station. Even though evidence pointed to his innocence, his court-appointed attorney promised George that he would get a short sentence if he pleaded guilty anyways. In a jailhouse letter, George said, quote, I agreed to confess and spare the county court costs. And so began the tale of yet another black man getting screwed by the criminal justice system. George ended up getting an indeterminate sentence of one year to life. If you've never heard of an indeterminate sentence, you're not alone. This type of sentence is designed to rehabilitate some prisoners. Then, if someone shows progress, they will get paroled closer to the minimum term. Unfortunately for George, maintaining perfect behavior was hard. He joined a prison gang and racked up six assault charges. For this, he spent more than seven years in solitary confinement. This time alone would bring him closer to all the communist heroes that Angela loved. During this time, George said, quote, I met Marx, Lenin, Engels, and Mao when I entered prison, and they redeemed me. By 1967, he was back in the prison's general population. George became an evangelist for his political beliefs. He began teaching classes in prison that drew upwards of 50 inmates. Eventually, the inmates began to revolt. First, they refused to do their jobs. Then, around 700 inmates began a hunger strike to protest the poor quality and often expired food that they were forced to eat. George was blamed for the protest. Along with a friend, he was transferred to Soledad Prison. Here they would start a Black Panther Party chapter. Before long, violence would erupt there as well. 
A prison guard killed three black inmates, shooting at them from above the prison courtyard. In an act of revenge, inmates killed a white prison guard. This would once again be blamed on George. Him and two other inmates were charged with first-degree murder. This trio would go on to be known as the Soledad Brothers. This is where Angela and George's love story would begin. Angela first saw George when she attended the Soledad Brothers pre-trial hearing in 1969. They wouldn't meet in person until a few years later in July of 1971. After this meeting, the two began exchanging love letters. The following is an excerpt of one of Angela's. This has been a week I didn't think I'd be able to survive. Not for many months have I been so depressed. So many other things around me have crumbled, but I don't think this is an appropriate time to bother you with all the details of my troubles. You're the only one who can bring me out of states like this. There's this huge thing between us. I don't love you less. That's something beyond my control. But I just can't go on like this. Please be kind to me and let me know immediately what this whole thing is all about. She circled back to this sentiment and openly declared her love for him, saying, quote, I guess I really was angry when I wrote this letter on the 16th. The anger has more or less subsided, although I essentially feel the same things I expressed in that anger. The anger that has given way to an unabated depression. If someone sees you tomorrow, please send back some word. I love you. George reciprocated those feelings, writing the following, quote, Time has become very important. I want you to believe in me. I love you like a man, like a brother, and like a father. Every time I've opened my mouth, Assume my battle stance, I was trying, in effect, to say I love you, African-American woman. My protest has been a small one. Something much more effective is hidden in my mind. Believe in me, Angela. This is one blank who's got some sense and is not afraid to use it. If my enemies, your enemies, prove stronger, at least I want them to know that they made one righteous African-American man extremely angry and that they've strained the patience of righteous and loving people to the utmost. In between the first time she saw George at the Marin County Courthouse and those letters stood a midsummer day that would change their lives forever and put Angela on the FBI's most wanted list. August 7, 1970, Jonathan Jackson walked into the Marin County Courthouse with a shotgun, handguns, and an assault rifle. As he barged in, he gave firearms to another inmate, a court witness, and a fellow Black Panther member. They took several hostages, a deputy district attorney, three jurors, and Judge Harold J. Haley. As they got on the elevator, they declared that they wanted the Soledad brothers freed by 1230. The hostages were pushed into a van outside the courthouse. Law enforcement was waiting for them. A shootout commenced. Jonathan was shot first. One of the hostages, the deputy district attorney, picked up a firearm and joined in the gunfight. Four people died, including Judge Haley and Jonathan Jackson. George is probably not shocked by what his brother Jonathan did. George once said about his brother, quote, He's a little withdrawn, but he is intelligent and loyal. And at that dangerous age where confusion sets in and sends brothers either to the undertaker or to prison. After the courthouse shootout, authorities connected the guns that were used to Angela. Since she bought the firearms used by Jonathan Jackson, they charged her with the resultant crimes, which were kidnapping, murder, and criminal conspiracy. An arrest warrant was put out for her on August 14, 1970. Angela wasn't having it and took off. Four days later, she was listed on the FBI's top 10 most wanted. She remained underground for nearly two months. She was caught at a hotel near Times Square with friend David Poindexter. After she was apprehended, President Richard Nixon praised the police, calling Angela, quote, a dangerous terrorist. Angela claimed she was innocent. The U.S. government was against her and held a grudge against her for being a communist. To overcome this, she would need a lawyer who is the best of the best. Angela's defense team included John Apt, the chief counsel for the Communist Party. Her love letters to George were presented at trial as the prosecution was hoping to show this proved she was involved with the escape attempt. Angela spent nearly 18 months in prison before thousands of supporters petitioned to have her released on a $100,000 bail. Finally, on June 4, 1972, Angela was acquitted on all charges by an all-white jury. They deliberated for just 13 hours. The public's reaction to Angela's incarceration was immense. People wore buttons that said free Angela and protested outside her prison. A legal defense committee was created for her. Celebrities even joined in on the movement. John Lennon and Yoko Ono wrote the song Angela, and the Rolling Stones put out the song Sweet Black Angel. Angela began sending George love letters in June of 1971. He died on August 21, 1971. 
On the day he died, he met with his lawyers. In just a couple of hours, George, along with two other inmates and three prison guards, were shot dead. Authorities say George was trying to escape prison and had a gun in his hand. Many people doubt this was the true story. George's behavior was so cooperative that guards didn't bother to even handcuff him on the day he died as he went to meet his lawyer. As the New York Times in their September 3, 1971 article said, quote, Neither the prisoners nor the guards who witnessed the bloodshed will talk about what they saw. The prisoners because they are suspected of murder, and the guards because they are under orders to keep silent. So whether he was trying to escape or was murdered by prison guards is up for you to decide. Angela Davis went on to have a distinguished career and legacy. As a result of her incarceration, she founded Critical Resistance, a group that aims to abolish the prison industrial complex. The love of a man likely caused her to help free the Soledad brothers and land her on the FBI's most wanted list. However, people change. In 1997, Angela did an interview with Out Magazine and announced that she was a lesbian. She's traveled and lectured all across the country. She's published several books and is currently a distinguished professor emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Angela was just 26 years old when she was arrested. When people are young, they do crazy things, things that age and wisdom might otherwise stop you from doing. When it comes to Angela and her life, would she do it all over again? Becoming an active member of the Communist Party, evading the police, being named on the FBI's most wanted list, helping the Soledad brothers? Was it too bold? For that answer, all we have to do is remember one of her famous quotes. I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. So what's the takeaway from this entire saga? Well, do your best to get a private attorney. Public defenders are overworked and underpaid and not your best asset for clearing your name. George might have been able to avoid all of this if he was able to get a better attorney. Angela put together a phenomenal legal team and managed to get herself acquitted. Meanwhile, George was wrongfully convicted of stealing just $70 and ended up getting more than a decade in prison. The government charged George for a crime he didn't commit. Getting a public defender is no great act of benevolence. It would be like getting hit by a car and then someone handing you a Band-Aid. When you're charged with a crime, you need to try and get the best attorney you can, even if it's the cheapest one you can find. Just don't let it be the public defender. Moral of the story, don't ever let someone, especially your government, become both your oppressor and your savior.